Christian Spirituality in the Catholic Tradition Part 15 From the beginning, the spiritual exercises proved a most effective weapon against the paganism of the Renaissance and the quietism of Lutheranism. Many of the Catholic clergy and religious were converted to a better life, and the exercises received the endorsement of Louis de Blois, St. Charles Borromeo, and St. Vincent de Paul. In 1920, Pope Benedict XV proclaimed St. Ignatius the patron of spiritual retreats, and in 1948, Pope Pius XII stated that the exercises of Ignatius will always remain one of the most efficacious means for the spiritual regeneration of the world, but on condition that they continue to be authentically Ignatian. St. Ignatius never lost sight of the fact that man must exert every effort to cooperate with God's grace. He was equally insistent that growth in grace is more God's doing than man's. He therefore emphasizes the importance of the prayer of petition for obtaining God's assistance. But because of the spiritual climate of his day, he also had to encourage the individual's cooperation with grace. Ignatian spirituality, therefore, will not tolerate passivity. It is a spiritual combat in which the chief weapons are meditation and particular examen. But it is an interior combat, a warfare which one wages against his own sins and predominant faults in order to prepare himself for the action of the Holy Spirit and the works of the Apostolate. Since the 16th century, the Church has been especially indebted to St. Ignatius for, follow, for the following contributions to Christian spirituality, the practice of spiritual exercises or retreats, a successful method for the practice of mental prayer, the universal popularity of the general and particular examen, recognition of the need for mortification but adjusted to the conditions and strength of the individual, the importance of the spiritual director, a theology of the apostolate as an obligation for all Christians, and an adaptation of the religious life to the needs of the times. With regard to the adaptation of religious life, it should be noted that St. Ignatius was as creative a founder as were St. Dominic and St. Francis in their time. They took the monk out of the solitude of the cloister away from manual labor and sent him forth to preach the gospel. St. Ignatius took from the friar his monkish habit, the choral office, the monastic liturgy and monastic observances, and gave the church a new kind of religious. The Jesuit was to have no distinctive guard other than that worn by the diocesan priests of a given location. He was to consider the divine office as an important exercise in prayer, but recite it privately. The liturgy would be a primary source of the spiritual life, and finally, Jesuits would practice daily mental prayer according to a determined method, general and particular examen, and would submit to mandatory spiritual direction. The Church would not witness such a change in the consecrated life until the sudden growth of secular institutes in the 20th century, and the majority of new religious institutes in the intervening period would implicitly or explicitly follow the pattern of the Society of Jesus. St. Teresa of Avila St. Teresa of Avila 1515 to 1582, 
had a double title in the preeminent place she holds in the history of spirituality, reformer of Carmel, an unsurpassed authority on the theology of prayer. Born at La Monida, near Avila, in 1515, she was from her earliest years drawn to God, and her devout spirit was fostered by the example of her parents. When Teresa was thirteen, her mother died, and the young girl went to a boarding school conducted by Augustinian nuns. She left the school a mature young woman and assumed the duties of man managing the family household for her father. By 1536, Teresa was convinced that her vocation was to religious life, and in spite of her father's initial unwillingness, she entered the Carmelite Monastery of the Incarnation at Avila. Once professed, Teresa determined to strive for perfection, but perhaps with more fervor than prudence, for she soon became so seriously ill that her father had to take her to a neighboring town for treatment. However, the treatment was worse than the illness, and Teresa was brought back to her father's home in Avila to await death. She did, in fact, sink into a coma that for four days she lay as if dead. Her grave was prepared at the Incarnation, and the only thing that saved her from being buried was her father's refusal. Gradually she recovered enough to return to the monastery, but she was completely paralyzed for some time. When at last she was completely recovered, she attributed her cure to the intercession of St. Joseph, and afterwards she always had a deep devotion to him. However, life at the Incarnation was far from the eremitical spirit proper to Carmelites, and Teresa herself spent much time at the parlor grill. The admonitions of her Dominican confessor, Father Baron, were of no avail. What converted her was the impression made on her by a realistic representation of the Ecce Homo. From that day on, her interior life improved. She became more recollected and drawn to solitude. Another great help that she received was from a Jesuit confessor, Baltazar Alvarez, only twenty-five years old, but gifted with unusual discernment and the ability to recognize the working of God in the soul of Teresa. Later she spent almost three years in the home of a very devout widow who was under the spiritual care of the Jesuits. At that time the law of enclosure was not strictly observed. Indeed, it may, in many respects, the monastic life was very lax. In 1560, Teresa and a few companions decided that what was needed was a reform of Carmelite life. Shortly thereafter, Teresa received the command from heaven to lead the group. After numerous difficulties and delays, the first monastery of the Reform was opened in Avila in 1562 and placed under the patronage of St. Joseph. For the rest of her life, St. Teresa was engaged in the absorbing task of making numerous foundations throughout Spain. She was almost constantly beleaguered by attacks and criticisms coming from the ecclesiastical prelates members of the nobility and her own fellow Carmelites. Yet at the same time, God provided good friends and loyal defenders. He also showered her with numerous mystical graces. Teresa passed to her eternal reward on August, uh, October 4th, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi in 1582 at the Alba de Tormes.
As a teacher of the stages of prayer, St. Teresa has never been equaled, much less surpassed. Since her day, practically all spiritual writers have been influenced to some extent by her writings. St. Alphonsus Liguri and St. Francis de Sales are especially noteworthy in this respect. She wrote primarily for the nuns and friars of the Carmelite order, and the success of her writings in all, in all the more remarkable when they consider the heterodox tendency that prevailed in 16th century Spain. Spanish Arabian mysticism, the Illuminism of the Alumbrados, the traces of Lutheran quietism, nor should we overlook the severe Spanish Inquisition personified in the zealous and ruthless Dominican Mel Melchor Cano. The teaching of St. Teresa can be found in her three major works, The Life, The Way of Perfection, and The Interior Castle, of which the last mentioned is her masterpiece. Unlike many of the treatises on prayer before the time of St. Ignatius, the works of St. Teresa are practical enough rather than theoretical description rather than expository, with invaluable psychological insights drawn from the personal experience and the penetrating observance of the conduct of others Using the interior castle as a guide, we shall trace the path of progress in prayer as outlined by St. Teresa. She pictures the soul as a castle composed of numerous suites or apartments, moradas, in the center of which Christ is enthroned as king. As the soul progresses in the practice of prayer, it passes from one apartment to another, till, eventually, after passing through the seven apartments, it reaches the inmost room. In, outside the castle there is darkness, and in the moat surrounding the castle there are loathsome creatures crawling in the mud. Once the soul resolves to cross, to follow the path of prayer and detaches itself from created things, it enters the castle and begins to follow the path of prayer, which leads first through which leads first through three stages of active or ascetical prayer, and then and through four stages of passive or mystical prayer. What does Saint Teresa understand by prayer? In my opinion, she says, Mental prayer is nothing else but a friendly conversation, frequently talking alone with him whom we know loves us. It is a loving dialogue between friends, and one's progress in prayer is a sure indication of one's process in the spiritual life. Although she realizes the importance of knowledge, St. Teresa insists that progress in prayer consists not so much in thinking a great deal, but in loving a great deal. Moreover, like St. John of the Cross, she is a great defender of the freedom of the soul to submit to the actions of the Holy Spirit. For that reason, she is always alert to protect the soul from the tyranny of a set method. St. Teresa did not equate the entire spiritual life with the practice of prayer. She also treats of a variety of other topics such as self-knowledge, humility, fraternal charity, spiritual direction, spiritual friendships, asceticism, and the apostolate. Coming now to trace the journey of the soul through the stages of prayer, According to the interior castle, we find that in the first mansions or apartment the soul is in, the state of a beginner, living in the state of grace, but still greatly attached to the things of earth and always in danger of falling away from its good desires.
The practice of prayer at this stage is purely vocal prayer. Upon entering the second mansion, the soul begins to practice mental prayer in earnest. Although there are frequent periods of dryness and difficulty which tempt the soul to give up the effort. The prayer characteristic of this stage is discursive meditation. Although discursive prayer is a reflective type of prayer, it should not consist entirely in reasoning, but should terminate in love. For those who have a tendency to use their intellects a great deal, Teresa responds that they meditate on Christ and converse with him. For those who find difficulty in controlling their faculties in, a, in meditation, she suggests they read or write some vocal prayer slowly and think about the words. Moving on to the third mansion, the soul enters upon the last stage of natural or acquired prayer which is called the prayer of acquired recollection. It is a consciousness and of the presence of God that is so vivid that all the faculties are united in a state of recollection and attention to God. St. Teresa advises that this type of prayer should be fostered if the soul cultivates an awareness of God's presence within it submits itself totally to the divine will, and strives habitually to live in the presence of God, even when engaged in occupations other than the practice of prayer. Since this stage of prayer represents a transition from ascetical to mystical prayer, it may be experienced in various degrees of intensity. The fourth mansion introduces the soul to the first type of mystical prayer, which is a supernatural infused prayer called by the generic name of prayer of quiet. It is an infused or passive recollection with, which consists essentially in an intimate union of the intellect with God, so that the soul enjoys vivid awareness of God's presence. However, the perfection of prayer in the forced mansions is the prayer of quiet, properly so called. It is a type of prayer in which the will is inundated by divine love and is united to ground as, in, as its greatest good. However, the memory and imagination are still free or unbound and they may sometimes threaten to disturb the soul. Therefore, St. Teresa advises that one should remain quiet and recollected before God, submitting oneself entirely to the arms of divine love. The goal of the divine operation is, on the soul is to captivate all the faculties and fix them on God. Consequently, in the fifth mansions, the soul is introduced to the prayer of union, which admits to a variety of degrees of intensity. In the prayer of simple union, all the powers of the soul are recollected in God. Then the soul realizes that God is present in such a way that when it turns in on itself, it cannot doubt that it is in God and God is in it. As God gains more and more dominion over the souls and floods with his light and consolations, the soul experiences the prayer of ecstatic union, which is the beginning of the sixth mansion and the introduce, introduction of the mystical spouse. As in the highest stages of ascetical prayer, so here at the heights of mystical prayer, the soul undergoes great trials and sufferings, the difference being now that they are mystical or passive purgations. It is not infrequent to find the souls at this stage of prayer are favored with extraordinary mystical phenomena such as raptures, flights of the spirit, locutions, visions, and so forth. 
When entering the seventh and last mansion, the soul realizes the, peti the petition of Christ to his heavenly Father, that they may be as one as we are also one, I in them and thou in me. John 17, 22, 23. This is the state of the mystical marriage or the transforming union and St. Teresa states that there is such a close relationship between the mystical espousal and the mystical's marriage that the sixth and seventh mansions could well be joined together. In the transforming union the three divine persons communicate themselves in an ineffable manner often by intellectual vision, and it is not unusual for Christ to reveal himself to the soul in his sacred humanity. The result is that the soul is totally forgetful of self, it thirsts for suffering and rejoices in persecution, and it experiences a great deal for the salvation of souls. Thus, the summit of mystical contemplative prayer is crowned with apostolic fervor. And as T Saint Teresa says, Martha and Mary work together. Although Saint Teresa had read spiritual works such as the Confessions of Saint Augustine, the Third Spiritual Alphabet by Francis de Osuna, the Ascent of Mount Zion by Bar Bernardine of Loreto, and possibly the life of Christ by Ludolf the Carthusian. Her doctrine is not from books. In fact, in reading books she usually discovered that they verified her own experience. According, according to her own testimony, the source of her teaching is God alone. But it would be an error to think that St. Teresa's doctrine was exclusively mystical. She wrote for contemplative nuns, it is true, but she realized that all of them were in the mystical state. In fact, she frequently states that sanctity does not consist in the extraordinary, but in doing ordinary things extraordinary will. The basis of sanctity is complete conformity to the will of God so that as soon as we know what he wills a thing, we subject our entire will to it. The power of perfect love is such that it makes us forget to please ourselves in order to please him who loves us. And the surest and quickest way to reach this perfection of love, says St. Teresa, is obedience, by which we completely renounce our own will and submit it totally to God. As means of growth and holiness, she gives special attention to the reception of the communion, the cultivation of humility, obedience, and fraternal charity, the observance of poverty, but above all, the love of God. St. John of the Cross One cannot discuss St. Teresa of Avila without thinking of her great collaborator, St. John of the Cross. They are so closely related in their life and work and doctrine that these are the two pillars on which he is constructed the Carmelite school of spirituality. St. John of the Cross, 1542-1591, is not as widely known as read and read as he deserves, and there are several reasons for this. He wrote primarily for souls that are already advanced on the path of perfection. His teaching on detachment and purgation is too demanding for some Christians. His language is often too subtle and metaphysical to suit the taste of modern readers. Yet, his writings and those of St. Teresa complement each other so perfectly that one of the best ways to understand either one is to study the works of the other. There is, of course, a noticeable difference between them, but it is a difference of approach 
rather than essentials. To understand St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa, it is necessary to consider the state of the true Christian life in Spain in the 16th century. Persons who claim to be savored with revelations, visions, and other extraordinary mystical phenomena were greatly admired and sought after. Some persons earnestly desire to receive these special gifts. Others actually simulated the stigmata or visions in order to impress the faithful. Illuminism gained great headway, especially in relaxed religious houses, as a means to eminent holiness without the practice of asceticism or the effort of acquiring virtues. All of the structured and institutional aspects of religion were rejected as obstacles, or as totally unnecessary for immediate union with God in the mystical experience. Pseudo-mysticism was the object of intense investigation by the Spanish Inquisition, which managed to control the situation but at the expense of further development of authentic orthodox spirituality. Some of the statements in the work of St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross may be open to misinterpretation if the reader does not take into account the Spanish situation in the 16th century. Born Juan de Yepes at Fontiveros near Avila, St. John of the Cross was only a few months old when his father died. Reduced to poverty, the family moved to Medina del Campo, where John worked at various trades and attended the Jesuit school from 1559 to 1563. At the age of 21, he entered the Carmelite order and was sent to Salamanca for his theological studies. Returning to Medina del Campo for his first Mass, John met St. Teresa of Avila, he had been thinking seriously about transferring to the Carthusians, but T Teresa convinced him that he should join the Carmelite reform. The first house of the Carmelite friars of the reform was founded at Dorello, and John and Anthony of Jesus were the founding fathers. For the next few years, John of the Cross held various offices, master of novices, rector of the college at Alcara, and confessor for the Carmelite nuns at the Incarnation in Avila. It was in this last assignment that he was kidnapped by the Carmelites, 1577, and held prisoner in the monastery in Toledo for nine months. On escaping from Toledo, John spent most of the remaining years of his life in Andalusia and was elected to various po posts of importance. However, in the provincial chapter of 1591, held at Madrid, John disagreed publicly with the vicar general, Nicholas Doria, who immediately deposed John. Humiliated but happy to be able to return to a life of greater solitude and recollection, St. John of the Cross ended his days at Obeda, where he died after much suffering. He was canonized by Pope Benedict the Thirteenth in 1726 and declared a doctor of the Church by Pope Pius XI in 1926. The major works of St. John of the Cross are the Ascent of Mount Carmel, 1579 to 1585, The Dark Night of the Soul, 1582 to 1585, The Spiritual Canticle, first redaction in 1584, and then a second redaction between 1586 and 1591, The Living Flame of Love, first redaction between 1585 and 1587, and second redaction between 1586 and 1591.
All of these works are commentaries on poems composed by St. John of the Cross, but the first two treatises are never completed. However, it is commonly agreed that the, the two treatises, Ascent, Dark Night, cover the entire subject matter contained under the divisions of the as active and passive purgations of the senses and the spiritual faculties. Having studied at Salamanca, St. John of the Cross was trained in Thomistic theology, but he also read the works of Pseudo-Dionysus and St. Gregory the Great. However, the author that most influenced St. John seems to have been Towler, although it is quite certain that he was familiar with the works of St. Bernard, Roycebrook, Cassian and the Victorines, Osuna, and, of course, St. Teresa of Avila. Nevertheless, Doctor of the Cross was not a slavish imitator of others. His works have a distinctive character all their own. The fundamental principle of St. John's theology is that God is all and the creature is nothing. Therefore, in order to arrive at a perfect union with God, in which sanctity consists, it is necessary to undergo an intense and profound purification of all the faculties and powers of soul and body. The ascent, dark night, traces the entire process of purgation and from the active purification of the external senses to the passive purification of the highest faculties. The living flame and the spiritual canticle describe the perfection of the spiritual life in the transforming union. The entire path to union is night, because the soul travels by faith. St. John of the Cross presents his teaching in a systematic manner with the result that it is spiritual theology in the best sense of the word, not because it is systematic, but because it uses as its sources sacred scripture, theology, and personal experience. In speaking of the union of the soul with God, St. John states that he is speaking of supernatural union, not the general union by which God is present to the soul simply by preserving it in existence. The supernatural union of the mystical life is a union of likeness, which is produced by grace and charity. But in order that this union of love be as perfect as possible, and as intimate as possible, the soul must rid itself of all that is not God and every obstacle to the love of God so that it can love God with all its heart and soul and mind and strength. Since any deficiency in the union of love is due to the soul and not to God, St. John concludes that the soul must be completely purified in all its faculties and powers those of the sensory order and those that are spiritual, before it can be fully illuminated by light of divine union. This results in the dark night, which is so called because the point of departure is a denial and deprivation of one's appetite or desire for created things. It means or the road along which the, show, the soul travels to union in the obscurity of faith, and the goal is God, who is also a dark night to man in the, his life. The necessity of passing through this dark night is due to the fact that, from God's point of view, man's attachments to created things are pure darkness, while God is pure light, and darkness cannot receive light. Stated in philosophical terms, two contraries cannot ex coexist in the same subject. The darkness, which is attachment to creatures, and the light, which is God, are contraries. They both cannot be present in the soul at the same time.
St. John then proceeds to explain how the soul must mortify its appetites or concupiscence and must journey by faith through the act of purgation of the senses and spirit. And although the treatment may sound negative and severely ascetical, he never tires of insisting that this purgation of nudity of spirit is not a question of the lack of created things, but the denial and uprooting of one's desires for them, or attachment to them. St. John gives a simple method for effecting the purgation. Have a habitual desire to imitate Christ, and to do this, study Christ's life and works, and then do as Christ did. In Book 2 of The Ascent, St. John discusses the active night of the spirit. He states that the purgation of the intellect, memory, and will is effected through the operation of virtue, and uh, faith, hope, and charity, and then explains why faith is the dark night through which the soul must pass to union with God. Turning then to the practice of prayer, he gives three signs by which the soul may know that it is passing from the practice of meditation to contemplative prayer. First, it is impossible to meditate as one was accustomed to. Secondly, there is no desire to concentrate on anything in particular. Thirdly, there was a longing for God and for solitude. What individual experiences is a loving awareness of God? And this is a type of contemplative prayer. The passive purgations are explained in the dark night, and at this stage God brings to completion the efforts of the soul to purify itself on the sensory level and in its special faculties. The soul is gradually led into the dark contemplation that Pseudo-Dionysius describes as a ray of darkness, and St. John calls mystical theology. And although one would expect that mystical contemplation would be delightful, St. John explains that the reason it causes pain is that when the divine light of contemplation strikes a soul that is not yet entirely purified, it causes spiritual darkness for it not only transcends human understanding, but it deprives the soul of its intellectual operation. Nevertheless, even during this dark and painful contemplation, we, the soul can see the streets of light which announce the coming of the dawn. In the spiritual canticles, John describes the soul's anxious search for God and the ultimate encounter of love using the symbol of a bride seeking the bridegroom and finally attending to the perfect union of mutual love. God draws the soul to himself as a powerful magnet drawn to mental particles and the journey of the soul to God is increasingly more swift until, having left all else behind, it enjoys the most intimate union with God that is possible in this life, the mystical marriage of the transforming union. Then, in the, flame, the living flame of love, St. John describes the sublime perfection of love in the state of transforming union. The union between the soul and God is so intimate that it is singularly close to the beatific vision, so that only a thin veil separates it. The soul asks the Holy Spirit to tear down the veil of mortal life, so that the soul may enter complete and perfect glory. The soul is so close to God that it is transformed into a flame of love, wherein the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are communicated to it. It enjoys a foretaste of eternal life.
and it should not be held as incredible in a soul now examined, purged and tried in fire of tribulations, trials and many kinds of temptations, and found faithful in love, that the promise of the Son of God be fulfilled, the promise that the most blessed Trinity will come and dwell with anyone who loves him. John 14.23 the Blessed Trinity inhabits the soul by divinely illumin illumining its intellect with the wisdom of the Son, delighting its will in the whole spirit, and by absorbing it powerfully and mightily in the delightful embrace of the Father's sweetness. Taken together, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross have given the Church a spiritual doctrine that has never been surpassed. So great was their influence, and so brilliant their exposition that they have far outshone all the other writers of the golden age of Spanish spirituality. Spain's Golden Age 16th century Spain produced a wealth of spiritual literature and an amazing number of saints. To some extent this was due to the historical situation of the period and the geographical location of Spain, cut off as it was by the Pyrenees from France, Germany, and the lowlands. Spain was not greatly upset by the effects of the Protestant Reformation, as were the countries to the north. By comparison, Spain was enjoying the climate of peace that is necessary for the development of spirituality and the, the writing of treatises on the Christian life. And although the Inquisition prevented the amount of freedom that one may have desired, it nevertheless allowed for the emergence of some spiritual literature of the highest quality. Unfortunately, in men like Mel Melchior Cano, the Inquisition was also the cause of much suspicion, excessive severity, unjust accusation, and, at last, a definitely anti-mystical trend that is completely alien to the Spanish temperament. Some of the most illustrious writers of the period were imprisoned as suspect and many more saw their works listed on the index. On the other hand, there was good reason why the Inquisition doggedly pursued the Alumbrados. In the early 16th century, pseudo-mysticism, with all its immorality and false vis visions, stigmata and ecstasies, had attracted many followers, especially from uneducated religious. From 1524 there was a gradual dissemination of Lutheran doctrine in Spain, a denial of objective morality, the rejection of good works and the claim of individual guidance by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual writers from the Franciscan and Dominican orders tried to correct the exaggerations of the pseudo-mystics, but by 1551 it became evident that the more severe measures were indicated, namely the Spanish Inquisition. The Franciscans were the first to provide the spiritual doctrine that was so sorely needed. Alonso of Madrid died 1521, published an ascetical treatise under the title The Art of Serving God. He first explained the basic theology of the spiritual life and warned against all types of sentimentality and illusion. Then he developed three fundamental themes, self-knowledge, growth in virtue, and the practice of mental prayer. St. Teresa of Avila recommended this work very highly for her nuns. In 1527, Francis de Osuna died 1540, 
published his third primer of spirituality, a mystical treatise on prayer which had a profound influence on St. Teresa of Avila. In a manner reminiscent of the Rhineland mystics, Osuna insists that the recollection in God can be attained only by detachment from the senses, and the perfection of the prayer of recollection consists in thinking of nothing in particular so that the soul can be completely absorbed in God. All this, however, must be done with a joyful spirit, for Asuna declares that those who are sad or dan downcast make little progress in the life of prayer. The entire treatise is developed from a psychological point of view, which greatly appealed to St. Teresa and characterized her own writing. Bernardine of Laredo died in 1540. A physician who became a Franciscan lay brother published the Ascent of Mount Zion in 1535, and then in 1538 he published a new version which reflected considerable change in his doctrine. St. Teresa of Avila states that she found a great deal of enlightenment and consolation in the ascent at the time she was particularly concerned about her, her ability to meditate on Christ. It is interesting to note that, whereas the edition of 1535 followed the mystical teachings of Richard of St. Victor, the edition of 1538 reflects the teaching of Pseudo-Dionysius, Hugh of Balma, the Carthusian, and Henry Herp. The ascent is divided into three parts, of which the first part deals with the process of spiritual self-annihilation, wherein the soul destroys sin and cultivates virtue, with self-knowledge and humility as indispensable elements. Bernadine maintains that contemplative prayer is not reserved for monks and friars, but that all Christians can attain it if they cultivate humility and follow Christ. The second part of the ascent provides meditations on the mysteries of life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Then, in the third part of the treatise, the teaching is entirely on contemplative prayer. In the edition of 1535, Bernadine stresses the role of the intellect in contemplation, following Richard of St. Victor. In the edition of 1538, he speaks of mystical contemplation in terms of the will, which surpasses the intellect by aspirations of love. Lastly, among the Franciscans we should mention St. Peter Alicantara, 1562, a reformer of the Franciscan order in Spain and an advisor of St. Teresa of Avila. There has been a great deal of dispute among the authorship of the treatise of prayer and meditation, which is attributed to St. Peter. St. Teresa herself states that he was the author of some little books on prayer, written in Spanish and widely used at the present time. The most commonly accepted hypothesis is that St. Peter made an adaptation of the Book of Prayer and Meditation, first written by Louis of Grenada in 1554. Then Louis of Grenada made a new edition of his work in 1555, and a de definitive version in 1566. Both of these authors exerted a great influence beyond the Pyrenees, and their doctrine on prayer was used as a source by St. Francis de Sales. Louis of Granada, died 1588, was the outstanding spiritual writer among the Spanish Dominicans, of the 16th century, although he did not escape the vigilance and condemnation of the Spanish Inquisition. Nevertheless, his books had such a wide range. Uh, Louis of Grenada, 
died 1588, was the outstanding spiritual writer among the Spanish Dominicans of the 16th century, although he did not escape the vigilance and condemnation of the Spanish Inquisition. Nevertheless, his books had such wide diffusion that they were soon translated into every language, including the languages of some of the mission countries. After several of his works were placed on the index, Lewis submitted the same books to the Council of Trent and received formal approbation for his teaching. What seems to be the ruin of his vocation as a spiritual writer turns out was turned into a victory beyond Grenada's expectations. For, in 1562, he received the title of Master of Sacred Theology by direct concession of the Master General of the Dominican Order. For, 35 of the 84 years of his life, he de dedicated his efforts to preaching and writing. And at his death in 1588, the general chapter of the Dominicans issued the terse statement, Via doctrina et sanctitate insins et in toto orba celebris. After St. Ignatius of Loyola, Louis of Grenada was the first spiritual writer to formulate a method of prayer for the lady, a method that was adopted by some of the religious orders in Spain. It comprised of six steps, preparation, usually the night before, reading of the material for meditation, meditation proper, which consisted of consideration, application, resolution, thanksgiving, offering, and petition. Lewis distinguishes between imaginative meditation using scenes from the life of Christ and intellectual meditation, considered of a divine attribute for a theological truth. Few writers have excelled Lewis of Grenada as an expert on discursive meditation. In addition to his works on prayer, Lewis also composed treatises, which were aimed at the conversion of Christians to a more devout life. <laughs>